Welcome to PALS. It's Prof. Sanyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. If you are new to our channel or you have not subscribed, we will love you to do so now and join this great anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. Today's lecture is on the development of the face. It will be divided into three parts. In part one, which is the one you are watching, we will focus on development of the major structures of the face. Then part two will be on some developmental anomalies associated with the face. And in part three, we will be considering multiple choice questions from various examination boards on the development of the face. So let's go to class. The human face actually begins to form during the fourth week of embryonic development. And by the sixth week, the external face is completed. Now, from that sixth week to eighth week, we'll be looking at the development of the palate. And then by around twelfth week, we'll be looking at the completion of the soft palate. The face develops from five swellings or processes. And these processes are located around the primitive mouth, which is called stomatodium. And these processes are the single frontonasal process, two, the paired maxillary process, and three, the paired mandibular process. These five processes are mainly of mesenchymal cells, which are derived from neural crest cells. Neural crest cells from the developing midbrain and forebrain will give rise to the frontonasal process, while the neural crest cells from both midbrain and hindbrain will contribute to the formation of maxillary and mandibular processes. These processes will then give rise to various structures of the face. So in this lecture, we will first of all show how these five processes are derived. Then we also show other structures that will be arising from these processes and how these other structures will come together to form the various parts and structures of the face. Out of these five facial processes from the frontonasal process, we'll be having the forehead developing, the sternal nose, nasal cavity, nasal septum, and then the philtrum. For maxillary process, it will be giving rise to lateral parts of the upper lip, upper parts of the cheek, and then for the mandibular process, we'll be seeing the lower lip, the lower jaw, and lower part of the cheek. So this is the embryo at the beginning of the fourth week of development. At this stage of development, that's after the formation of the head fold, two prominent bulgings are seen on the ventral aspect of the developing embryo. One is the prominence of the developing brain superiorly, and then the second is the pericardium placed inferiorly. Between these two prominences, we see a groove. This groove is called the stomatodium. Deep to this stomatodium is the developing foregut. So within the head prominence is the developing brain, and then uh, within the pericardium is the developing heart. Another developed structure present at this fourth week is the pharyngeal arch. The pharyngeal arches are curved cylindrical mesodermal thickenings on each side of the upper part of the developing foregut. They lie between the two prominences we've mentioned, the head bulge and the pericardium. The most important arch for the development of a face is the first arch, and this arch is called the mandibular arch. The next important arch is the hyoid arch, which is the second arch. Now, between the two sides of the stomatodium, we see the first arch surrounding it. Now, at the floor of the stomatodium is this structure I've already mentioned, which is the bucopharyngeal membrane or oropharyngeal membrane. This membrane separates the stomatodium from the developing foregut. That means that at the beginning, there is no connection between the feature mouth with the developing foregut. But in the course of the development within the fourth week, this membrane breaks and establishes communication between the feature oral cavity and the foregut. We will consider the formation of the first facial process, which is the frontonasal process. The mesenchyme covering the developing forebrain and midbrain will proliferate forward and anteriorly to form a downward projection. This downward projection will overlap the upper part of the stomatodium. The name of this downward projection is the frontonasal process. We have the first facial process, which is the frontonasal process. 
With the frontonasal process formed, we will consider the formation of the next two processes, which are the mandibular and the maxillary processes. Now, the mandibular arch, which is we said is the first arch, will give off a board from its dorsal end. This board is called the maxillary process. It will grow ventromedially above the main part of the arch. Now, the remaining part of the arch will now be called the mandibular process. The maxillary process is a dorsal projection. The mandibular process is a ventral projection. At this point, we have the five primordia for facial development. The frontonasal process, the maxillary process, and the mandibular process. We will now proceed to the subsequent structures that are formed by these processes. We will first consider the frontonasal process. Here, we will start with the development of the structures called the nasal placodes. At the end of the fourth week, the ectoderm overlying the frontonasal process will show bilateral localized thickenings that are situated a little above the stomatodium on either side of the midline. These bilateral thickenings are called the nasal placodes. These nasal placodes will actually give rise to the olfactory epithelium. Now, these placodes will first invaginate or will appear to do so, giving rise to a depression. The name of that depression is called nasal pits. The pits are continuous with the stomatodium below. That means there's a connection between the nasal pit and the future mouth. As the nasal coat invaginates, the surrounding structures around it are elevated. This will give rise to the formation of the next important structure in our list. So these structures are the medial and lateral nasal processes. The nasal processes are the raised edges around the, each of the nasal pit. The medial part of this elevation is called medial nasal process, while the lateral part is called the lateral nasal process. That is to say that the nasal placode, the medial nasal process, the lateral nasal process are all derivatives of the frontonasal process. Each medial nasal process has an enlarged lower end that is called the globular process of his. We have now established most of the major structures coming from the frontonasal process and will present the one from the maxillary process in the course of the lecture. We are ready to consider the formation of various parts of the face. We will start with the lower lip. The mandibular process of the two sides will grow towards each other and fuse in the midline, forming the lower margin of the stomatodium. We will proceed to the formation of the upper lip. Each maxillary process will grow medially. First, they will fuse with the lateral nasal process. Second, they will fuse with the medial nasal process. Also, the medial and lateral nasal processes will fuse with each other. With the fusion of medial and lateral nasal processes with each other, and also with the mastoid process, the nasal pits, at this time called external nerves, that were initially communicating with the stomatodium, will be cut off and be separated from the stomatodium. The maxillary processes also undergo considerable growth, while the frontonasal processes become narrower from side to side, therefore bringing the two external nerves together, as we can note in the illustrations in A, B, and C. We will now take a look at the components of the upper lip. The mesodermal and ectodermal components of the lateral part of the lip are from the maxillary process. The mesodermal component of the medium part of the lip is from frontonasal process, but the ectodermal part is the extension of the ectodermal component of the maxillary process. By this, it implies that the overlying skin of every part of the upper lip is derived from the ectoderm covering the maxillary process and no contribution from the frontonasal process. And by reason of this, 
the, the entire skin of the upper lip is innervated by the maxillary nerve. Earlier on in our lecture, we noted that the circumferential arch contributed to the formation of the face. Now look at how this contribution came about. This is because the muscles of the face, including those of the lips, are derived from the mesoderm of the second pharyngeal arch. Therefore, they are supplied by the facial nerve. And facial nerve is the nerve of the second pharyngeal arch. It's a derivative of the second pharyngeal arch. We will consider formation of the cheeks next. After the formation of the upper and lower lips, the stomatodium is very broad. In its lateral part, it is bounded above by the maxillary process and below by the mandibular process. These two processes will need to fuse with each other and as they begin to fuse, the cheeks will be formed. The maxillary process will enlarge to form the greater part and the upper part of the cheek, while the smaller and lower part of the cheek will be formed by the mandibular process. Before now, we have also noted that maxillary process fuses with lateral and medial nasal processes. It also, in addition, fuses with the medial angle of the developing eye, and this will lead us to the formation of the nasolacrimal duct. The line of fusion, of fusion with the medial angle of the developing eye will leave a groove called the nasoptic furrow or nasolacrimal sulcus. It is this nasolacrimal sulcus that will later become the nasolacrimal duct. We will present a very brief account of the development of the eye. The region of the eye is first seen as an ectodermal thickening called the lens placard, and this appears on the ventrilateral side of the developing forebrain, which is lateral and superior to the nasal placard. Now the lens placard will sink below the surface and will eventually be cut off from the surface ectoderm. The developing eye will then produce a bulging in this location. The bulgings of the eyes are at first directed laterally and lie in the angles between the maxillary process and the lateral nasal process. But with the narrowing of the frontonasal process, they come more medially and then get located at, it, at the forward final position in the face. The eyelids are derived from the folds of ectoderm that are formed above and below the eyes and also by mesoderm enclosed within these folds. We will consider formation of the nose next. In the formation of the nose, the nose receives contributions from one, the frontonasal process and from medial and lateral nasal processes of both right and left sides. Now, external nerves are formed when the nasal pits are cut off from the stomatodium by the fusion of maxillary process with medial nasal process, as we noted earlier. These external nerves will gradually approach each other. This is as a result of the frontonasal process becoming narrow. We will now look at the development of nasal cavities. The nasal cavities are formed by extensions of the nasal pits. If we remember, the nasal pits came as a result of the invagination of the nasal placodes. At this time, frontonasal process is seen between the two nasal pits. Now, this process started with the fusion of the medial and lateral nasal processes. As this fusion occurred, also a horizontal partition was formed between the pit and the stomatodium. This horizontal partition is called the primitive palate and it is a derivative of the frontonasal process. The nasal pit will deepen to form the nasal sac and the nasal sac will expand both posteriorly and inferiorly. The posterior part of the sac is first separated from the stomatodium by a thin membrane called the buccal membrane. This membrane will later break down 
to allow communication with the stomatodium and create a postural opening for the nasal sac. At this point, we know that the nasal sac has a ventral opening or external nerve that communicates with the exterior. With the breaking of the buccal membrane, it has a posterior opening that opens into the stomatodium. And this posterior opening is called the primitive posterior nasal aperture. The two nasal sacs are at first widely separated from one another by the frontonasal process, but with the narrowing of the frontonasal process, these two cavities will come together. Intervening tissue between these two cavities will become thinned down to form the nasal septum. So we are going to take a summary of the derivatives of the nose and nasal cavities. The lateral wall of the nose is derived on each side from the lateral nasal process. The original olfactory placodes, as we noted, will form the olfactory epithelium. The frontonasal process will form the bridge of the nose. The nasal pit will eventually give rise to the nostrils. And then the nasal sacs will elongate and then give rise to the nasal cavity. Next is the formation of the external ear. The external ear is formed as a result of a series of mesoderma thickenings, which are called tubercles of hillocks, that are seen at the, at the first cleft. The first cleft is the external groove between the first and second pharyngeal arches. These tubercles will give rise to the pinna. The pinna, when first formed, lies inferior to the developing jaw. But as development continues, it is pushed upwards and backwards to its definitive position due to the great enlargement of the mandibular process. This also implies that if the mandibular process fails to enlarge or to enlarge properly, it will affect the final position of the ear. At this point, we will consider some additional processes that will arise from maxillary process. And in considering this, we will look at the development of the palate. From each maxillary process, a palate-like shelf will grow out medially. This horizontal process is called the palatal process of maxilla, or the secondary palate. By this outgrowth, we now have the three components from which the permanent palate or definitive palate will be formed. And that is the primary or primitive palate, which develops from frontonasal process, and then the two secondary palate or the palatal processes of maxilla. We we'll first look at the primary palate. We said they are formed due to the fusion of the two medial nasal processes of the frontonasal process. This primary palate will be seen opposite the upper jaw carrying the four incisor teeth. It is also called the premaxilla or the primitive palate. Now it undergoes ossification and forms part of the heart palate, but it actually represents a very small part of the definitive palate and is seen lying anterior to a fossa called the incisive fossa. The permanent or definite, definitive palate is formed by the fusion of these three palates and this fusion occurs in three stages. And these three stages are one, there will be fusion of the two secondary palates with the primitive palate. And this fusion has a V-shape in this form. Number two, there will be fusion of right and left secondary palates. This fusion occurs in the midline and runs from anterior to the posterior. The fusion of the two secondary palates with themselves and with the primary palate will give us a Y-shaped appearance. The last stage of this fusion 
will be the third stage, which is the fusion of the palatal processes with nasal septum. Now, in the definitive palate, it has two major parts. The anterior, tree, the anterior tree over four of the permanent palate is ossified in membrane and is called the hard palate. While the distal one over four is the unossified part that forms the soft palate, this part has a small inner part that is called uvula. This is where we we'll stop in this part one of the lecture on development of the face. In part two, we shall be considering all the anomalies associated with development of the face. And in part three, we will be considering multiple choice questions from various board exams on development of face. So feel free to let us know how we can serve you better in the comment section. And don't forget to press the subscribe button if you have not joined us and you will be the first to get all our new videos. Thank you and see you in our next video. Welcome to PALS, it's Prof. Zanyangu's Anatomy Lecture Series. If you are new to our channel or you have not subscribed, we will love you to do so now and join this great anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. This is the continuation and the part two of our lecture on the development of the face. We recommend you also look at the part one of this topic where we handled the basic formation of the various parts of the face. Also, it has a part three, and in the part three, we'll be considering various multiple choice questions from various exam boards on the development of the face. So let's go to class. The formation of the face involves fusion of various components. Occasionally, this fusion may be incomplete or may not happen at all. And this will lead to various anomalies. The first anomaly we'll handle is the appearance of a cleft in the upper lip, which is called hair lip. Hair lip can be unilateral, it can be bilateral. Unilateral hair lip is when there is a failure of fusion of maxillary process with media nasal process on one side. When this failure of fusion happens, on both right and left parts, it leads to bilateral hair lip. We also have another cleft called midline cleft of the upper lip. In this condition, there is a defective development of the lowermost part of the frontonasal process. We'll look at cleft of the lower lip. When the two mandibular processes fail to fuse with each other in the midline, the lower lip shows a defect in the midline. Now, we look at oblique facial cleft. Oblique facial cleft is when there is a non-fusion of the maxillary process with the lateral nasal process. This will give rise to a cleft running from the medial angle of the eye to the mouth. When this happens, the nasal lacrimal duct is also not formed. Next, we look at the fusion between the maxillary process and mandibular process. We said in part one of this video, that fusion of these two processes will give rise to the cheek, then there are other structures that arise as a result of this fusion. Now, when these two processes refuse to fuse, it leads to a defect called the transverse facial cleft. And this shows a cleft running from the angle of the mouth to the ear. Sometimes this fusion can occur, but it will not be adequate. When this happens, it will result to a condition known as macrostomia 
wide mouth. Some other times, this fission may be a little too much. And then when the fission is too much, it results to microstomia, which is small mouth. Now we'll consider bifid nose. Bifid nose is a condition where the nose is separated at the midline. This could be due to bifurcation of the front nasal process and is usually associated with median cleft lip. Another anomaly associated with the formation of the nose is known as proboscis. Proboscis is a congenital tubular nose seen coming out from just below the forehead. We also have a condition where the entire first arch may remain underdeveloped either on one side or both sides. When this happens, it affects the lower eyelid, the maxilla, the mandible, the standard ear. Generally, it affects all the structures that are formed from this first arch. This condition is called mandibulofacial dysostosis or first arch syndrome or Trichia Collins syndrome. We have anomalies associated with the development of the mandible. The first is retrognatia. This is a case where the mandible may be small compared to the rest of the face. And then this, this results to a receding chin. And in other extreme cases, we can have a total failure of the mandible to develop. And this condition is called agnasia, where there is a failure of development of the entire mandible. Now we look at hypertellurism. Hypertellurism is a condition where the eyes are widely separated and the nasal bridge is so broad as you can see in the images. This condition usually comes as a result of the presence of excessive tissue in the frontonasal process. The lips may show congenital pits or fistula and sometimes may even be double. Defective fusion of the various components of the palate gives rise to clefts in the palate. So we look at cleft palate. As is noted in the flowchart seen here, we have two types of cleft palate. We have complete cleft palate and then incomplete cleft palate. Complete cleft palate where the cleft actually passes through the entire palate and then incomplete when the cleft did not run through the entire palate. Now, in complete cleft palate, we still have bilateral complete cleft when both clefts are on both sides and then we have unilateral complete cleft when it is on one side. Then for incomplete cleft, we have cleft of the hard and soft palate, cleft of the soft palate, and bifid ovula. We we'll take bilateral complete cleft palate. This is a failure of fusion of the two secondary palates with each other one and also with the primary palate. This leaves a Y-shaped cleft and the various halves of the palate are separated. This condition is usually accompanied with bilateral cleft of upper lip. In unilateral complete cleft, there is no fusion of one side of the secondary palate with the primary palate, leaving one part of the secondary palate completely separated, as you can see in the illustration. This condition is usually accompanied with unilateral cleft palate of the upper lip. Now the incomplete palate. Cleft of hard and soft palate is when the cleft runs through the entire soft palate and is limited in the hard palate. In cleft of the soft palate, the cleft is limited to the soft palate. And then bifid uvula is a condition where there is the cleft is limited in the uvula part of the soft palate. This is where we stop in this part 2 of a lecture on development of anatomy of the face. In part 3, we will be considering multiple choice questions from various examination boards on development of the face. So, we hope we've been able to make your knowledge of the development of the face a little better.
So we urge you to feel free to let us know how we can serve you better in the comment section. And please don't forget to press the subscribe button if you have not done so already and you will be the first to get all our new videos. Thank you and see you in our next video. Bye.